Welcome to part two. I'm here today with John Cadogan, autoexpert.com.au, right? .au. There's a bit of yin and yang in this conversation because I know nothing about cars. I can change a tire and John knows everything about cars. And he is, without doubt, the most fearless car reporter and trucks and other things that move on four wheels in the country. He has no corporate advertising like us. He has no government advertising like us. And he has the privilege and the comfort of being able to speak his mind uh, without fear or favour. John, now Tesla has been one of the big stars uh, marketing uh, you know, the green car uh, in recent years and its share price is still at great heights. You don't have the same view on Tesla's future as uh, many others. Can you tell us what the outlook for Tesla is, do you think? Tesla's a bubble. It's a ridiculously overpriced bubble. And I, uh, Tesla's also a religion. And Elon Musk is electric Jesus. Like, he just is. This is the role that he occupies, you know. He, can, he could basically tell you up was down and the faithful would believe it, right? And he's made so many proclamations that have failed to come true. You know how fusion power has been five to 10 years away for the past 50 years? Mm. Well, autonomous cars and autonomous Teslas have been 18 months to two years away for about the past six years. And he makes these other promises, the Tesla semi, you know, the full-size semi-trailer, mm. Not here yet. Years overdue. The cyber truck is also years overdue, and these proclamations that are, have never come true are just. There's a thousand apologists for that kind of thing, and he don't, there's no obligation on him to produce those products, I suppose. But in the domain of facts, they were promised and they're not here, and that's kind of a red flag to me. And the other thing is. The car industry is just starting to come after Tesla now. There's a massive rollout of mainstream electric products. And Tesla's kind of had the EV game to itself to a large degree up until this point. But now they're going to have Volkswagen and Daimler and Hyundai and Ford and a whole bunch of the established players who really know their stuff. They're going to come after Tesla. And the only thing that can happen is Tesla will incrementally lose market share. I mean, that's a done deal. And whether that ends in tears, whether it ends in a share price collapse, who knows? But Tesla's share price cannot remain as elevated as it is now for any great length of time into the future because it's unjustifiably high. So it's just about to be subject to a deluge of competition by people with big marketing budgets too. But what, what about the... Uh what about the future for EVs generally? I think you've made the point um, many times that Tesla, uh, it would probably, if you really want to look after the environment, that the, that the actual carbon that goes into making a Tesla would outweigh the carbon of you just driving your old bomb and keeping it for another five or 10 years rather than buying a Tesla. I mean, have you done the numbers on that? Is that, is that correct? There's a is it all complete greenwashing? It's largely greenwashing. There's no question that there are benefits to EVs, such as reduction of toxic emissions in our cities, okay? Air pollution kills more people prematurely than car crashes, and that's a serious issue for big cities, okay? And no tailpipe emissions is a big fat solution to that problem. So big tick there. So if, if you care about that, okay. If you also want to divorce yourself from buying liquid fuel, okay. If you want to feel good about that, okay. But there's absolutely no question in my mind that the greenwashing happening with electric cars generally is the car industry saying, consume your way to a green future with our product. Okay. And I wouldn't be, I just wouldn't be buying into that because there are substantially more CO2 emissions from the manufacture of electric cars. And there's no question that the greenest option is hang on to mum's Corolla and drive it for another five to 10 years. And this is grossly unpalatable to the car industry generally. And let's not forget that the car industry has no real commitment to green this or green that. Look at one of the world's largest car makers over the past 20 years. Look at Toyota. 
Toyota will happily sell you a Prius or a RAV4 hybrid, but they will also sell you a two and a half ton CO2 belching Land Cruiser if that's what you want. They're completely bipolar or amoral when it comes to the products they sell. And the greenwashing of the car industry is just to appeal to people with uh, green aspirations. So they'll keep the turnover up. But the question is, and government policy will determine to a certain point as well, various government policies, how long uh, the petrol cars will will last. So when will the last petrol car be sold? Oh, well, it's really the lack of government policy that is going to determine the future for Australia because we don't, we, we're not on the front foot with any of this stuff, you know, about f- policy for fuel security. We don't have a Charging policy. Charging stations. Yeah, oh, look at that. We've got the largest distances between our mm. capital cities of just about mm. any other country mm. on earth. Mm. And we don't have anything like even approaching an adequate charging network. If you want to drive from Sydney to Dubbo, you have to do actual logistic planning, right? Mm. And in Europe, you don't have to do that. There are charging stations everywhere. We don't have the rollout of that stuff. And the other thing is recycling of the batteries, okay? We drink 30 billion litres of liquid hydrocarbon fuel every year in Australia, and you can easily calculate the environmental cost of that, okay? But if your battery croaks in your EV in the 10-year term, we don't have recycling policy in place here. So if recycling is economically rational, meaning if your lunched battery can be taken to a facility where the raw materials can be extracted at a profit, then that's an industry. Great. Free market. Fantastic. But if it's a loss leader, like if you're going to make a loss recycling a battery, I see a whole lot of landfill and you really don't want lithium hexafluorophosphate in the landfill. Like you really don't want that. And we don't have policy for that kind of thing in Australia. And part of that is because in Victoria, for example, they want to tax EV owners, right? Mm. We're the only market on earth that wants to do that. And ScoMo is happy to walk into Parliament with a lump of coal saying, hydrocarbons, aren't they great, right? This is why we don't have policy and we haven't even asked the questions that matter, which are, what's important for Australia's environmental future? You know, do we... is is electric cars a real priority for us at this point? Or should we concentrate on greening up the grid? How about nuclear? Whatever, right? I don't know the answers to these questions. And mainly that's because the people in a position to make these judgment calls have not posed them. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a culture of, um, of deny, denialism at the moment, generally, isn't there? I mean, you don't, I mean, with plastics, I, we did some work on on that, and we're surprised to find that you know how you go out every night. You put your your plastic, your pet bottles in your plastic, and yeah. you put your cardboard in that one. Then most of it ends up in landfill anyway. Or and they're going to burn it in Indonesia. Or, or they'll burn it in Indonesia. They'll take yeah. it offshore and give it to the Indos. Totally. Or, yeah, totally. But you know this. Tr- just researching this basic, how much stuff is actually recycled? We couldn't even get an answer from any official channel <laughs> on that. There was completely just. We're not going to come to grips with that yet. Now, part of the reason is technical because plastics are all different kinds of plastics, so it's hard to recycle, and and that has to be addressed, I guess, as well as other things. But But there's a disconnect here, right? There's a Mm. massive disconnect, and and this is like solar energy, okay? Recycling is something that we've all bought into. We've all got our yellow bins. Mm. We all put our cardboard in. Society, individuals, you and me, we're we're recycling, Mm. okay? Mm. The failure is happening upstream because the recycling is either not happening or we don't know if it's happening, right? And it's a little bit like photovoltaics. Every second house around here has a big array on the roof. So the community, individuals like you and me, have said, yeah, 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 we're into that. Green power, fantastic. We want to do the right thing. We've been led to believe this is the right thing. All these people have got solar panels on the roof. SCOMO still telling the electorate that coal is going to be a major part of the mix for decades to come. Like, one of us is out of touch with prevailing community sentiment. 
and it's not us. We're certainly behind the rest of the world. We're yeah, not, yeah. not there. We're not behind perhaps Indonesia, but, but we're but not behind. It's no, the, the management. The community is on board. Yeah. The community is believing the science and, and what will inevitably happen to coal. Sure. Uh, but the politicians, of course, well, that's money and politics again, something we've covered um, in depth. So just just in terms of, I mean, there is a lot of competition in the car industry. I've looked at this and, and they do struggle financially. They have their bad years and so on, and they market heavily compete in the marketing and TV advertising and that kind of thing. So there's competition there. And a lot of them don't pay any tax from time to time and stuff like that. What would you see as the greatest sort of problem with the regulation at the moment? I mean, is it general regulatory apathy? I mean, I noticed the ACCC had a crack at Mazda the other day and, and, and so on. The ACCC has actually emerged from hypersleep and had a crack at quite a few car makers. And I think the benefit to the consumer there is that many car makers onshore in Australia have operated under the flawed perception that consumer law only applies to toasters, right? And the ACCC's recent actions have woken some of those car makers up and said, no, 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 dude, cars as well, okay? So this means that if you have a major failure of a car outside warranty, but within the period that the legislation would consider to be requiring, quote-unquote, reasonable durability, then you are entitled to a free repair or in some cases a refund in full or a replacement. That's under the legislation. It's not them being good blokes about it. And I, I just find it atrocious that the barometer of excellence for customer service in the car industry, for example, is are we complying with the legislation? Like you're going to spend $250,000 on a Mercedes-Benz S-Class and I don't know about you, but if I was going to drop that amount of coin on a car, I'd want consumer law compliance. I'd want to, I'd want better than that. I'd want to be treated like business class, you know? I, I really would want to be treated nicely, not just in accordance with the minimum standard of the legislation, for example. But look, the other thing that's really hitting the car industry hard at the moment is the global shortage of computer chips. Because, you know, COVID, working from home, mm. lots of demand for computers, gaming consoles, TVs, things So their prices nature. have gone up, their well, wholesale stuff. Well, the chips are just unavailable. The mm. cars are not being manufactured. It's six months worth of waiting time on an average car at the moment because there's so much demand for computer chips. And obviously, if you can't supply the chips to run the computer systems in the car, you can't make the car. Okay, so that's a bit of a problem. And it's basically lifted the lid on supply chain vulnerability because the car industry is a specialist at screwing down its suppliers. They're going with one supplier for everything, screwing them right down on price. And the chip manufacturers have kind of gone, you know what, I'd rather sell more profitable chips to Samsung at the moment, if that's okay with you. And that's why if you want to buy, I don't know, a Hilux or maybe a RAV4 hybrid is a good example at the moment. It's going to be maybe eight months wait before you can have your car as a result of this kind of supply chain vulnerability and the impact of COVID on that. It's always been refreshing to see your opinion, your frank opinion on, on various uh, brands and yeah, so on. Yeah, the car on. makers Something, think that the too. The car mate. makers, I, yeah. I bet they do. I bet you're the favourite person of the public relations department of the auto industry. You did say most fearless in your intro and the truth is most hated. But you like being hated because you're doing your job. I'm indifferent it's, to it. You a, want to hate me? Okay. So so tell me, let's just run through a couple of your, your best and worst. But just give us a, on a human level, what's the best car you've ever driven? I mean, you must have been a... You must have been treated to a different car every week when you were back in the yeah, corporate totally. media back in the day. What's the best car around to drive? I've got to tell you that uh, oh, it's a big Ferraris, question, but... look, Ferraris and Porsches, supercars, they leave me cold. They really do. When you call them fashion statements on wheels, don't they you? Are, they, they are largely fashion accessories, and certainly most of the people who own those kinds of cars are unable to drive them in the manner that they're designed to be driven, the performance that they purport to offer is inaccessible because you've got to have some pretty spooky software in your head to do that. You have to be Mark Webber, essentially, or someone just like him. What I really like 
is examples of cars that are designed to do a particular job and they're faithful to that to that role they're really good at that so if you want an accessible performance car i'll have a hyundai i30n every day of the week if you want a eight seat people mover i'll take a kia carnival because it's a really slick execution of that genre you know so these are not the kinds of cars that people imagine car enthusiasts salivate all over but you know it's it, it, for me because i trained as an engineer i'm really into design and how well it's executed and what is the actual role that that car is uh, is is targeted at and like the first time i drove a porsche it was like it was like sex with a supermodel although i haven't tested that hypothesis that you expect it to be better because you've wanted to do it your whole life and then you get in one and you go well, I've driven my. Is that I, it? I, I've driven, is that it? I've, I've driven a friend's Porsche, and frankly, I didn't like being one foot off the ground and the heavy steering and so on. And they the tram other thing line is, and the, yeah, I've got to say, unpleasant. I mean, yeah. you know, with, when it comes to cars, you're either a wanker or you're not a wanker. And I didn't like the idea of driving a Porsche because people would look at you, and that's the whole purpose, perhaps, for a lot of people in owning these sort of cars. And you get self conscious, sort of people staring at you. Oh, that's a Porsche driver. So I, I didn't like the Porsche experience at all, but I didn't find it very comfortable to drive either. So I think. Here's, you 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 know a lot about more about this than me, but there's a lot of vanity in car decisions. Isn't yeah, well, here's the great dichotomy of look at me. Okay, if you buy a car like that, you're in your Ferrari. People are looking at you, and you've wanted that. Okay, but the 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 thing is, a large proportion of those people are thinking, "What a wanker!" Right? They just are. Well, that's what I I tend to think. Yeah, exactly. Like, but you do tend to be blind to that if you own that kind of car. And pro tip. It's not that nice driving a Ferrari or a Porsche from Martin Place to the eastern suburbs. It's just not. They're not meant for that. They don't feel good doing that. They tram line. You feel every bump. It's it's just not that kind of thing. And the law of diminishing returns is in play as well. Like if you buy a 7 Series or an S-Class, like one of those big, fat German luxury limousines, mm. That'll cost you 10 times as much as a mainstream car, but and it's better, but it's not 10 times better. So in the, the, the driverless car thing, which is always a few years away as well, and of course it would save some people and industries a lot, uh, a lot of money, uh, but there's a gigantic industry, the car industry, which isn't going to want to see that happen, I presume. Uh, unless I don't think they care. Autonomous cars, if they can deploy an autonomous car, that'd be fine because you're still selling a car. And wouldn't it be lovely to drive to the CBD and say to your car, just do a few laps while I shop and I'll ping you with my mobile when I want you to pick me up. When does that come? I mean, technologically, it could probably happen now. I mean, the infrastructure isn't there for it, but it could happen with tech technology right now, couldn't it? Here's the problem. If you released a mandate that said every car will be autonomous from 2040, yeah. they could probably do that but you'd have to scrap every existing car. And the real challenge for autonomous cars is coping with people, people behind the wheel, because people do batshit, stupid, unpredictable things. You see, you drove here several kilometres across the city to get here today, right? You saw people behind the wheel do batshit, crazy, unpredictable things. Computers do not respond well to that, okay? If you make every car autonomous, Every car in close proximity can talk to every other car and they can make agreements. We could we could make traffic lights obsolete. And cars could just go, I'm approaching this intersection. And they could do like minority report science fiction precision where you go through an untraffic light controlled intersection whoosh, like that, just miss. I'd be happy with the computer doing that, but not if you throw biological drivers into the mix as so, well. So they can talk to each other, but they can't talk to bad drivers. No, they can't cope with us. The problem is us. It's not the computer technology. Coping with us is a problem. The same deal with the trucks. So we're talking logistics. Yeah. En masse, it could happen and it will happen probably at some point, but, and that would save the transport industry a lot of money. But of course, at what point? Uh, I mean, they, these are huge killing machines potentially. If, if, if It would only take one to put reform back one accident many years of well, something like that. See, there. this is a really good question, okay, because 
this opens the door to the the ethics of road death. What are the ethics of road death? How many deaths, like coronavirus, because, how many deaths are acceptable? Well, it's it's which particular deaths are acceptable because if, you, if I'm driving down the road and I go through one of those linear strip mall kinds of shopping centres and a child steps out between from between two cars and all of a sudden it's life or death and like you slam your foot on the brakes and all the technology takes over and anti-lock brakes and all of that stuff, whether or not you miss the child and what happens to you legally after that, it's partly due to your reactivity. Could the crash have been avoided? Did you do everything you could yeah. do? In the, in the case of that, that identical situation happening with an autonomous car, the car has to decide. Am I going to go on to the other side of the road and have a head-on crash with another car or do I miss the child? Mm. And that's going to be down to the ethics that are programmed in by a human. Who lives? There are four humans in one car which you're going to hit head on. It would have to make right. a judgment upon whether they're going to be you what know, if, quadriplegics yeah. or, or whatever. And how does a, how does a machine get? What that if sort there's of a situation that transpires on the road that's going to that's, that's going to end up with some person dying? Yeah. You got to decide who, and you got to decide who way upstream, including in the, the car, including the people in the, your own car, yeah. of course, and yep. not the little child running yep. across the road. You got to decide in the code who survives, yeah. right? And I don't think we know the answer to that ethical question. And I, I'd love to talk to a philosopher about that, like an ethics expert. How mm. do you decide? Mm. Yeah, medical ethics are a thing. You know, the the religious are are, are into uh, down on stem cell research, mm. right? Whereas if you suffer from Parkinson's disease, I suppose you're all for it. I don't know. What are the ethics of doing the research? What are the ethics of the computer code if someone's going to die? Who dies? Well, it sounds like it's a, it will be a long road between deciding the ethics and the community acceptability mm. and legislating for this kind of thing. And do you then know who, do you it know who Bridget the... Driscoll is? Bridget Driscoll's the first person who ever died of a car crash in recorded history. This was in London. The death happened at some low speed, like eight miles an hour. There was outrage, like how could this sort of thing have happened? You know, it's it's really amazing. And I see a similar kind of reaction to autonomous road death, autonomous driving death. Like there is going to be a reaction to the the to the inevitable morbidity that flows from autonomous cars. And, you know, I'm not just here to talk about cars, okay, because I'm just as interested in the work that you do and the overlap that there is in society between, you know, the way that journalism and corporate influences are kind of manipulating the media and the media is kind of a bit of a succubus for this sort of thing. So, I see a lot of overlap. You do a lot of reports on finance and politics and things of this nature, but I see the same kind of disingenuity in the motoring domain as well in terms of the spin that's put on what car companies say and what they don't say and stuff like that. So maybe we should drill down into some of that. Absolutely. These things are changing. Like Community expectations do change mm. and and things that were okay to do 50 years ago, you can't do anymore. And that, that's happened with business since about 2015 uh, when they had the corporate tax inquiry, inquiry and they realised just how many rip-offs were going on, that the double Dutch Irish sandwich wasn't a smart, cool thing to do. It was just a rip-off. Yeah, but public opinion only, that changed. Uh, public opinion only affects these companies when journalists raise these issues because they don't, <laughs> no corporation issues a public statement that says, we're behaving like bastards. Check this out. Nobody says that. Which is precisely right? the problem. And you need to be, yep. you need to yep. have good, high caliber journalism to raise these red flags in the public interest. Otherwise, they're always getting swept under the rug. They just sink it without a trace. Next stop, Marianas Trench. Well, 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 which brings us to the point that if you have the mainstream now controlled so tightly, you know, News Corp, Nine Entertainment, uh, Seven, of course, they're all on board together. Yeah. Two out of the three of them got JobKeeper, um, as well as well as this the government license subsidies, as well as, as well the, as the money from Google for promoting them. And yeah. Rupert, Rupert's mob haven't paid tax in Australia for seven years. This sort right. of thing, uh, I'd probably never. I mean, he's he's one of the world's greatest tax dodgers. Mm. It has the temerity 
to get all these troops to preach to people about public morality and what yeah. you can do and can't do. I mean, it's the hypocrisy is incredible. But if you look at it, these places now, as you pointed out, you go to Google and you search for something and then you get taken to a paywall. A paywall. Yeah. And they want you to sign up to, to get public information, what should be public information. Now, so where is it all going then? If they're all paywalled because they want to get that subscription revenue, besides their corporate advertising revenue, and a lot, who's the biggest corporate advertiser? Well, who's the biggest advertiser? Well, I, I suspect. The government or I Harvey think it Norman. could be the government. Yeah. Could be the government. So that you don't want to go criticising the government too much, because sure. especially in an election campaign, imagine being too critical. The government says, sorry, Channel 7, never going to happen to them, of course, but mm. we're just going to cut your advertising for a week. That's going to cost you 50 million bucks. Yeah. Uh, you know, whoever's done the, whoever's on that side of the Chinese wall is going to be talking to the editorial people. Well, that was the biggest arc up I ever had from an advertiser was in 2011. I, uh, I was driving to Canberra to do a job. And I got this call from a producer on Today Tonight, and I'd never met her, right? And she goes, well, I want to talk to you about the Australian car industry and the influx of Asian cars into Australia and all this sort of stuff. And I go, yeah, okay, but I'm going to Canberra. She said, I'll just go to Parliament House. We'll go to the studio there and we'll just get one of the reporters to read the questions to you and you can just answer them. I went, okay. So they asked me one question. Well, they asked me more than one question, but the question that got me in hot water was, what do you see the future for Australian car manufacturing being. This is in 2011. I said, I don't think there'll be an Australian car manufacturing industry in 10 years' time. I can't tell you when, but in 10 years' time, I was actually very generous in hindsight. But this caused the most monumental mm. arc up. Mm. Holden is like on the phone to the executive producer of Today Tonight. Mm. It's Armageddon, mm. <laughs> right? How could you mm. let this clown say this mm. kind of thing? You know, it was an honestly held view. And uh, I think history is kind of on my side, retrospectively. Well, absolutely, 100%. But, but next time you go to do a piece, if you've got any sort of intestinal fortitude at all, you're going to think you, you, you're going to do it again. But that just endangers your job yeah. as a reporter. And it, it gets back to the self censorship thing. Totally. And, and you just go, look, this is going to be too hard. So a lot of these guys in, in the camera doing the political stuff. They bury the news story in the in the in the fifteenth paragraph. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's like the criticism yeah. being way down here, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you, but who writes? Who does the headlines and the stand first or the picture choice of the yeah. bright smiling person or the? But the interesting thing to me, the one heartening thing in this sort of fairly bleak <laughs> exchange we've been having, is mm. that you've gone from essentially nowhere on YouTube to 53, 54,000 subscribers in a very short space of time. And compared with the other mainstream motoring outlets, the Cars Guides and whatever, I've got more subscribers than most of them, which always yeah. amuses me because they've got far more resources to throw at things like video production yeah, than, than I do. Absolutely, a so, lot more traffic, mate, too. Yeah, so, so there yeah. is a thirst mm. for yeah. the unvarnished, honestly held view. And I hope that's what comes across in this conversation is that we're just observers of this game with fairly unique perspectives because one of the things about journalism is you've, you're an insider, you've got access. You've got access that ordinary people don't have. Mm. If you're a political journalist, you've got access to the Prime Minister to ask questions yeah. directly. If you, if you report on business, you've been taken out to lunch by some CEO and you've been given access to him that ordinary people don't get. Car, motoring journalists, same thing, different pool, right? And I think there really is a thirst among the audience for this kind of unfiltered, honest, authentic exchange of information in the domain of journalism. It's just, it's absent with uh, Rupert's mob or Costello's mob. Like, it's just not there. Mm. Well, it gives you, it's a, it's a, it's a terrific advantage in a sense, isn't it? I mean, you, you know, you've got to rely on the community for your funding because you're not getting it from corporations, yeah. you're not getting it from government, but at the same time, the comfort of being able to speak your mind. And, of course, you get you know, with even people that don't agree with you on things, they are still so at least you, you can have your say, at least you've got the freedom of opinion. But, of course, now this is, this is tightening. The net's tightening around the mainstream and they're protecting it. They're subsidising now through the Google News Showcase thing. Yep. So Google's 
had a bit of cash extorted out of it and Facebook, and that's going to Rupert's mob, Costello's mob, yeah. and a few others. And so they're actually cross subsidised. That law hasn't even been ratified yet, as far as I'm aware. But the but bills the cash, being paid. The, the bills yeah. are being paid. So Google's yeah. going, oh, well. Okay, I'm going to go, which they've done. I checked their accounts. They've gone back to paying no tax again after paying a little tiny <laughs> bit, right, on their five odd billion dollars worth of income yeah. that you can see. Uh, and they pay a little bit to, you know, maybe I don't know, 20, 50 million or something you know, to, the, to these other guys. And deal done. Faustian Pact has, has been struck. Yeah. And uh, the question, of course, is where it, where it goes. How far is it going to go? Because we've seen the latest Dutton trying to set up a you're at least talking about setting up a fund to be able to sue people for defamation in social media. Mm. But social media is jacking up. They're sick of it. But the government's talking about making YouTube a publisher so that YouTube could be a co-respondent in a defamation case because, as you know, if... Well, they are in the Friendly Geordies case. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. And, and that hasn't been dismissed. Well, right? to, give, that- to give Google, which owns YouTube, it's... it's, it's um, yeah. It's, it's credit. They are, are actually fighting the rest of the Barilaro action because mm. Barilaro, of course, walked away from suing Jordan Shanks because yeah. he knew Jordan was just going to use it as terrific publicity. And sure enough, he's, he got another 100,000 subscribers during that time Absolutely. when Barilaro was suing him. So it was good publicity, a stupid move by Barilaro. Yeah. But to save face and maybe to get a few dollars, John Barilaro decided to keep the action on Google and they've said, Sorry, we're not caving into this one. Mm. It's too public for us. Usually they'll just sling a little bit of money somewhere, and, but it's too it's too public. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Now, if a court comes down and says that, yes, YouTube, you're a publisher, not a platform, um, already, you know, it's not if somebody comments the high court decision last year, if somebody comments on somebody else's thread without even the person who's running the thread knowing it, that's now libel because they're yeah. relying on case law from the 18th century in England. Yeah. When, it, it's all gone. Yeah. The past 20 years of the internet has changed everything and the law is way back, as far literally back as the 1600s, 1700s. I know. We're talking, law- we're, talking the, we're talking the carrier pigeon was the epitome of communications technology back when the, the law was framed, right? And yet old laws apply to modern offences. Yeah. This is the problem. The common law. And the High Court, to give them credit, the High Court, its role is to adjudicate on the laws. Its role isn't to make the laws. Yeah, it doesn't the set the ball policy. The yeah. is squarely in the court of the legislators, yeah. which is Parliament. And, and to get back to the original, to come full circle, Parliament's been enfeebled by corporate money, by lobbying influence and political donations, and by credibility because the public confidence is falling. So their ability to be able to go out and just enact good laws is seriously diminished. So we're in this kind of like murky, you know, we're paddling on the spot. This is what's happening and and nothing much is going ahead and things that need to be done in political and government terms aren't getting done. So the question is, I mean, where does it go? Well, that is the $64,000 question, isn't it, right? Because we might wake up in 10 years' time and find that there's a whole bunch of additional independent journalists just like us having emerged from this Vacuum because mm. nature does a boil a vacuum, and mm. there is a vacuum of there's a vacuum independent journalism like this, and mm. or we could wake up and they've shut us cracked down. down on yeah, them because yeah. their their media allies will support the extinguishing of their competition. But I don't. They want to never mention in- us because they don't want to give us any airplay, and so yeah. it's kind of like if the government decided to bring in these anti, you know, social media laws. Um, I mean, some of them are probably, I mean, having to have your name on a post, I think that's probably reasonable stuff like that. But the fact that you get sued so easily. But the number of people hiding behind fake names. Like, do mm. you engage with Green Man 222? Occasionally you can't help yourself, can you? <laughs> Occasionally somebody will just be such a dick that you'll just go, you'll, yeah, you know, whatever. But no, generally, I mean, very rarely. I, I, I don't like to block people. I just mute them. If you have to append your name to something you say, though, I think I see that as a net positive. That's positive, yeah. Because hiding behind some fake name does, it does empower you to release the worst part, inflict the worst parts of your character. But it gets back to the problem with that, of course, is I'm a bit of a radical free speech guy. The reason is because I can cop a bit of criticism, always have, and 
I kind of quite like it. Sometimes I miss it if I'm not, you know, I used to get death threats, not getting yeah. them anymore. Yeah, I haven't had one for a week. Like, what have I done? Am I losing my that's touch? That's right. Nobody's touching <laughs> me up on Twitter. Look what's going on. <laughs> but I think the problem with that is that because of the way society is going with big government and these big institutions that are concentrating, they're now, as we know from JobKeeper, they're all too big to fail. If the thousands of people that work there, they can't, if they've all got social media policies. They'll get sacked. For expressing their opinion. Sure. Look at look at the guy that worked for um, oh, um, Michaela Banerjee. Uh, she was a public servant. She said something about government's policy on asylum seekers. Got the sack. Went all the way to the High Court. The court ruled on law and upheld the the sacking. So, the question, of course, is if society's going that way, we're in these gigantic corporate silos with all these rules around what you can say. That's like a communicational North Korea. Well, it. it, it it means if they're allied to the government and you're part of them, you cannot express dissent. So I would say, I, I agree with you. I think people should have their names on their posts and anonymous cowardly tweeters, as I call them, I don't have any time for them. But the fact is, there's a lot of people out there that are making good contributions anonymously. Mm. Uh, it tends to be a bit of a mob rule, someone's, but because they work for one of these institutions. Yeah, if you have a legitimate threat that some kind of harm is going to befall you, mm. inclusive of losing your job mm. and therefore your ability to support your family, pay the mortgage, all of that stuff, mm. then fair enough. Uh, and for well, whistleblowers you're going to self-censor, aren't you? Self -censor, aren't yeah, you? yeah, but yeah. you need to protect the identity of whistleblowers as well because mm. obviously there are consequences for them. And just in general, if you append your name to your view, you're more likely to be circumspect and responsible with what you say. And that's a net positive. It is positive. There's no doubt about that. Everyone just... knows who you are when you talk on your channel. Everyone knows who I am. And my reputation mm. and your reputation, such as they are, they they rest on the legitimacy of the next thing you say. That or, or not. Or otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. No, that's exactly right. I, and I agree with you. I just think that the one possible outcome is as you have these big corporate silos everywhere, you will have people, if they did bring that in, you'd have more of a sort of haves and have nots situation anyway. I mean, it's going that way mm. anyway in a sort of, you know, haves and have not. I mean, inequality is since the, uh, since the virus is really just completely ballooned. It's really exploded. Totally. And, um, I mean, if you look at the asset prices on the ASX and property prices, they've just gone. So the people that have stuff are worth a lot more. Mm -hmm. The people that have nothing are still doing their 41, what is it? No, $44 a day now. Yeah. Uh, so now eventually with AI, and you know more about this than me, but AI is going to eventually make entire sections of workforces redundant which means that how do we look after the rest of the, let's say, the 20% structural? I mean, already there's a bloke that I used to work with. He sets up a bot service which does journalism. Um, just it's all automated, all digitised. He just pulls stuff, his computers pull stuff down from, from the SEC, from Wall Street, and from the NASDAQ and Bloomberg. They just pull all this stuff in and it, they, you don't actually need reporters anymore. You can just get it done automatically. You still need pundits like me and you, mate, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to waffle yeah. on with their big opinions. Sure. But you won't need reporters to go, the profit went up this much, the dividend thing, the, the CEO said this and blah, blah, blah. That that could go tomorrow. Now, that just in our little workforce, that would, again, gets rid of a whole lot more jobs. Totally. don't know what happens with cars. I don't know what happens with other sectors. But, but you would news, to... news could go under the bus easily like that. Just the reporting of news, news. could get under the If you look at banking, like that's facing major structural issues too. Mm. They're hanging onto their, they're hanging onto their turf as well. So, yeah. I think we're only a little bit of the way through this whole digital revolution thing, and it's just it's like the Chinese curse about living in interesting times, isn't it? And look, it is, I think yeah, the other yeah. thing that we should canvas in in closing is that it really has been an interesting three years. We had the fires and we thought things couldn't get worse than that and then you know, look what happened. Mm. Do you see things getting back to pre-COVID normalcy in society or are we sort of irrevocably changed? Well, I think just talking to people that used to go into work in the city every day, I think there's going to be a lot of change behaviours. I think people are more comfortable with working remotely. Well, you've got your COVID formal wear on for this, this interview. And this so is I'm, 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 dressed, I'm overdressed, mate. I this is like spit. job interview. <laughs> so, <laughs> Come on. So uh, where does it all go? 
look, a lot of it will return. I mean, p- human nature doesn't change, mm. just technology changes, doesn't it? So things will, things will return, but I, I, I'm not sure, like, will all the, you know, it's like one of the law firms I was talking to in the city, they had eight floors, they're going to go back to four or something like mm. that. What happens to that is it become housing. Zoom, now everyone can Zoom. Sure. So do you really need the travel? Do you need to travel as much? Uh, I think it's sped up the inequality thing because of government decisions, and this is, I think, the biggest thing. I think we really have this this serious problem with government policy providing for the future generations. And of course, with this one, we missed, of course, in this conversation, we were talking about health and and other decisions that government makes. The climate stuff. Oh, totally. Where do they get their advice from? When it, when it comes to defence, they seem to get their advice from the weapons manufacturers, from think tanks that are funded by weapons manufacturers like ASPI. Yeah, and knock me down with a feather. The advice is, here's some hardware you need to buy. That's right. And where, and where that's right. And where did like a tank? How how good's a tank? Yeah. And then and then Gladys Berejiklian cover this. Where does she get her health advice? Well, she probably gets a bit from health people, but where's she actually taking the advice? And certainly. Um, John Perrottet. Mm. I mean, from the business council, from the from business people, yeah. yeah, and from and party donors and this sort of thing. So, when it comes to climate, we know where they're getting advice on climate action from. They're getting it squarely from fossil fuel companies. Sure, and this is the problem. And this gets back to your point about Australia being a bit of a laughing stock. COP twenty six in Glasgow, like you know, it was a bit. Could you know, we have looked any worse? You know, and then this deal with ARCUS, which is the AUKUS, I think it's called, which is reactive. It's a bit last century, isn't it? Mm. Like we're sitting in the middle of Asia and we're doing a deal with the old motherland and the Yanks who are fine. They're, they're in the sunset of their imperialism now. And we're beating the drums of war and against China. And we're just going like that to China. And, and, it's, and, uh, and we're like this big and China is yeah, like, yeah. you know. So they're getting, they're getting advice. They're not... In, with health, they're not taking it totally from the scientists. Sure. This is the problem. And so you've got to look about where, where they're getting their advice from, where they're acting, and it, and it just goes to the corporatisation of the state and an obesity media which isn't holding people to account. Mind you, we shouldn't overplay the role of the media. There's many other factors. But certainly it's, it's, it's difficult to know where it's going to... Difficult to know where it's going to, to go here. And you would think that if they do try to repress public opinion and so on, it could get a little bit nasty. Yeah, there's eventually going to come to a spot where there's a little bit of backlash or maybe a lot of backlash, and that that tends to be self-correcting over time, but it can be quite uh, interesting in the moment. And we know that the regulators are pretty intolerant of dissent in Australia. So mm. that could be... The one certainty in all of this is there's not going to be a shortage of things for you or I to report talk about lots of material, over the next few lots years. Of material. So we should revisit this if uh, if you like. And it's been uh, very interesting talking to you because you've got so many uh, similar, there's so many similar things about the way you operate to the way I operate. In particular, the number of the impressive number of bridges you must have burnt to get where you are today. And uh, I've done the same sort of thing. So. Anyway, I I hope you keep burning a few more. Many of the bridges. We should do it again sometime. Well, it's been an endurance event, but I'm interested to hear from you. If you'd like to hear this kind of thing, give us a few suggestions. What would you like us to dance around next time? I'd love to know. You can let me know on my channel or here on Michael's channel. I'd be really interested in what you think. Thanks very much for watching.